lot of people. To honor Brother Keith Burnett. So even during a time of a pandemic or a virus, so much for social distancing. For us to come together like this, and everyone that's come through to give their thoughts and sympathies to the family, it's, it's impressive. And he was an impressive man. We're going to have a lot to say about that. We'll begin this evening by reading the obituary, and then we'll sing a hymn together. Alan Keith Burnett, age 84, of Russellville, Kentucky, passed away Saturday, June 6, 2020, at his residence. He was born in Cumberland County, Illinois, the late Olin Clark Burnett Sr. and Elva Lorraine Ragon Burnett. Keith was an elder of the Northside Church of Christ in Russellville and also a preacher of the gospel for over 65 years. He was preceded to death by his brother, Clark Burnett, and a sister, Pat Calvert, and is survived by his wife of 61 years, Bobby Jean Cook Burnett, two sons, Eric Keenan Burnett, and his wife, Jean, of Bowling Green, and Ronald Jean Burnett of Park City, a sister, Mariana Schick of Garland, Texas, five grandchildren, Eric Blaine, his wife, Mackenzie, Rand Michael Burnett, Maria Ellen Burnett, Keela Marie Willoughby Burden, and Carla Jo Hamilton, Mason, the two, and the two great grandchildren, Kirby Joe Hamilton and Luna Nicole Burnett, and several nieces and nephews. The graveside services will be conducted on Wednesday. As the family travels tomorrow uh, in Hazeldell, uh, Illinois. The family asks that donations be made to Florida College in Temple Terrace, Florida, or the Sons of the American Revolution, or SAR, uh, to President Adam Scales. The envelopes are available here at the funeral hall. We appreciate everyone's attendance. Let's give thought to uh, Brother Keith and what he meant to us as we sing praises to God and share messages from his work. On the road and the road, turn and we must stand. But we have come from realms above. We receive permission when we give and pray. Let us send us in the call of love. Science calls and training are from the throne of love. say that now they know how the evangelist Timothy felt about the Apostle Paul. There are so many things that could be said today and a lot will be said. And I have to say that it's unfair to the rest of the guys that I'm going first. Uh, but to spare everybody, there's so many things that can be said that, that uh, We'll just say a few things, and, and hopefully uh, that will suffice. Uh, Bobby Jean, I've had a lot of people comment on my tie. And uh, she gave me this tie about 17 or 18 years ago when I was coaching baseball. And uh, I pulled it out today to wear it. And first time I've worn it in a long time, and as Jack, as you probably can tell, I'm about to choke to death. So <laughs> I need a smaller body or a bigger jacket. I don't know what. What, what it needs. Keith Burnett, to me, was a spiritual father. And I think you understand what I mean by that. I don't call him father. But he was a spiritual leader, a spiritual father, a spiritual mentor. That man taught me how to study the Bible. I grew up in the church. 
But I really never knew how to rightly divide the Word of God until he taught me. I remember about 1990, Kim and I lived in this old, well, the old white house beside Service Auto Parts. You know where that is, where we lived in the back part of that. We were members at the Memorial Boulevard Church of Christ in Springfield at the time. And this old house had 900 windows down one side. And you could see everything out and they could see everything in. Walmart didn't sell enough blinds. Well, I looked up one day and here come this long, white Lincoln Town car with the fins on it. And it was Keith and Bobby Jean. And they came to ask us and asked me if we would consider placing our membership at Northside and working under Keith. And we accepted. From that time forward is when I learned more about Scripture than I'd ever known. He taught me <clears throat> how to go to the jail and teach people. He taught me how to go overseas and teach people. He taught me how to go to the hospitals and baptize people that wanted to obey the gospel. He taught me how to preach at funerals. And I'll miss those words, my, my. <laughs> that was key, my, my. In 1993, at the Northside Church of Christ, we appointed elders. We started the radio program, Bible Talks. And Ralph Wright and Keith Burnett were the first two elders that was appointed to the Northside Church of Christ. That congregation flourished. That congregation was taught Bible. It wasn't fed anything but truth. And that man always had a smile. Kim and I moved to Evansville years ago. And there was turmoil up there. And I would call back down here and I'd cry on Keith's shoulder. And he'd say, brother, it's just making you stronger. I said, I think I got the wrong number. <laughs> <clears throat> what do you mean this is making me stronger, Keith? Can't you see I'm miserable? And here I was in my 20s, a long time ago. He said, but brother, it's making you stronger. You just don't see it now. If I would have only listened to what the man said all the time, I could have saved a lot of misery in a lot of people's lives, my own. I have sat down in homes of people with Keith, and he never shunned anybody the gospel of Christ. We have sat in the homes of people that had plenty, and we have sat in homes of people that had nothing. And one in particular that I remember so well. How ants go everywhere together. Colonies. He and I were sitting in this home one night having a Bible study and the people had cockroaches like that on their walls. Do you think that bottle key? No. The gospel is for all, and that's what Keith done. He asked me years ago when I was working with him to preach a lesson on Galatians chapter 6, both a physical and a spiritual point of Galatians chapter 6. He had some hard tasks for you to do, but he always did it so that you would learn. And in that, in Galatians chapter 6, it's talking about sharing with those who shared the gospel with you. Now that doesn't mean that I had to pay Keith. 
That doesn't mean that I had to give him anything. What that simply meant was he was the mentor teaching younger men to teach other people because after they're gone, the gospel will still continue and you share in that good news. That's how you share it. Is that what that man taught a lot of us young men to do. Now it's our responsibility to take that on and continue that. Words cannot express how much I loved him and how much I love Bobby Jean. And to the family, I'm very sorry. To myself, I'm very sorry. I'm selfish. I want him back. But I wouldn't want him back to go through what he could have had to go through. We can rejoice in that. Keith gave me a book one time, and in the back of it, he wrote this. And he quoted from the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul talked about, he said, take pain with these things and be absorbed in them so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to these things. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. For by in doing this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. You know, a lot's been said about this COVID. But when I got the news that Keith passed, you know, the government may want us to halt everything. But one thing COVID could not do it could not stop the angels of heaven from escorting that man to the place of paradise in the presence of Abraham awaiting that great and final day. We don't know all the works of the angels, but we know what's revealed. And we know at the death of a faithful child of God from Luke chapter 16, that they will escort a faithful child of God to the presence of Abraham. And from all that I knew of that man and Saul, that's my conclusion. And I will close by saying this. As humble a man as Keith was, he probably would not have said this, but to wrap up Keith's life in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15, 16, and 17. Where Paul said, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, but not only me, but also for all those who have loved his appearing. Thank you. Just want to take a moment to say amen to what uh, Brother Grant said. I agree with that wholeheartedly, everything that um, he said. You know, we come to this house of mourning to comfort one another at this time. Our brother in Christ, Keith Burnett, has departed his earthly vessel, and that's what sets before us at this moment. But his eternal spirit has slipped out of that earthly vessel and has returned to be with God for safekeeping. Let me say a few things about Brother Keith and I. I met Brother Keith in 1993. My family and I had just moved to Caneyville, Kentucky, where we began to work and labor with the good brethren there. I was told that Brother Keith Burnett was coming for a gospel meeting in a few weeks. They had asked me to put together 
the, in, the invitations or the flyers that needed to be uh, handed out. And the time had come and Brother Keith had showed up early. Uh, Sister Bobby Jean was with him. Uh, I was, they was very cordial. Uh, and um, <clears throat> as we uh, went to the church building that morning and had morning services, after it was over, Brother Keith took me aside. He said, I, I need to talk to you for a minute. And, and I said, okay. So he whispers to me, you spelled my last name wrong. <laughs> well, I didn't know what to say to that. I, I mean, I was dumbfounded. I just looked. He says, now, he said, John, Burnett is not spelled with two R's. It's one R, and you need to remember that. I said, okay. I, I tried to apologize to him. I said, I, I am really sorry, Keith. I, you know, uh, uh, they, they just, I just moved here, and they asked me to do this. And, uh, but um, he still seemed maybe like he was a little upset what I had done, even though I didn't do something like that uh, on purpose. Well, as I walked away after getting a slight rebuke, I guess, from Brother Burnett, I thought to myself, wow, what a first impression. <laughs> and then as time passed, of course, I decided one day to get Brother Keith's phone number and call him. Of course, I didn't know what to expect after our first encounter. And so I called and we talked for a little bit on the phones. And from time to time, uh, we would talk with one another. And this is how our friendship grew. This is how our bond began to become uh, stronger and we begin to grow closer and closer and closer. So much so that later on when we would go overseas together, Keith would introduce me as his son in the faith. And I, I thought a lot of that. I, I felt really proud and privileged that he thought of me like that. We had a lot of intimate moments where we would talk but I, I will tell you this. I had told Keith one time, I said, you know, you, you've been more to me than a real father. I, I said, you know, when we come into this world, we come into this life, we don't, we don't get a choice of who our parents are going to be. But I said, you know, I would have I would enjoyed growing up in your household. I thought a lot of him and a lot of Bobby Jean. And I used to express that to him. Many more things I confided in him about my family life. And so Keith took me under his wing and I appreciated that. I loved him and he loved me. And the feelings were very, very mutual. We know that when we read in the Bible the Word of God, the Apostle Paul, a lot of times when he talked about Timothy and Titus, he would re refer to them as his beloved sons in the faith. We can find that in Titus 1 and verse 4 and 2 Timothy 1 and verse 2. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 2. Many times when Keith would uh, say something along this line, he would, he would refer to one of those passages. He said, I, I am like Paul. And he said, this is my Timothy. Keith and I, of course, had made many trips overseas. 
We went to Jamaica together. We went to Belize. And we went to the Philippines several times. About three months ago or four, Keith was wanting to go back to Jamaica and I was all ready. But as things begin to unfold, he would say, you know, I don't, I don't feel good. And, you know, and, and I've got to take care of Bobby G. I said, okay. I said, well, maybe, maybe sometime in the future things will work out where we can take one more trip together. Well, we didn't get to do that. But I am happy for Keith. I'm happy knowing that he died in Jesus Christ. Happy in knowing the kind of life that he lived. And as Brother Brent said, and many of you know, he was a very humble man. And he was a man also that like to joke around every once in a while. <laughs> you know, I have to tell, I, I, talking to my wife, she said, uh, well, why don't you tell them that one story? Well, she, I've got so many stories to tell, I could probably write a book. But anyhow, on one occasion, we was, uh, Keith said, hey, let's go over here and walk down the beach. And as we was walking down the beach, Keith, always carried the camera with him. He liked to take pictures. I could not never believe how many pictures that man took when we went to overseas. I don't know what he'd done with them all. And so we came upon this uh, hut there along the beach, so to speak, that we was walking up. And I looked over there, and me and Keith saw that they were carving out a canoe by hand. So Keith decides he wants some pictures. So he stops and begins to take pictures. The two or three guys stopped working, picked up their machetes, and walked towards us. <laughs> I said, Keith, we are going to die. <laughs> he said, oh, no, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. I said, Keith, it doesn't look good. <laughs> Well, as they approached, you know, the men got there, they stopped. I kind of stepped back just a little. I let Keith do the talking. <laughs> and then the one fellow said, uh, what are you taking them pictures for? What are you going to do with them? Well, Keith said, you know what, I just like your, uh, you know, that, that's very good work that you're doing, hand carving that. He says, I remember him saying to Keith, he says, no, you're going to take them back to America and you're going to show them to people, and you're all going to sit over there and laugh at us, aren't you? I thought, it's over with. <laughs> and then, one thing I learned from that day forward, that as long as Keith was with me, and we was overseas anywhere, I'd be fine. Because I found out that guy could talk his way out of anything. <laughs> and he stood there and talked to those guys enough till finally, you know, and then at the end, he says, well, here's what I'll do. He said, let me give you this $20 bill. He said, I'll pay you for them pictures, which that was good thinking. I was, you know, I was too nervous. But they took the money, and, uh, you know, things went well. We walked away, and I looked at Keith. I said, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> and he just smiled, that smile that he had, and kind of grinned and laughed, chuckled. Just kind of shook his head, and we walked and we walked on. But I say this to you, I have never loved another person like I did Keith. You know, Jonathan and David had such a love for one another. It was a great love. And I believe that Keith and I experienced that kind of love. And I appreciated that because it made me feel good. 
to know that that man loved me and he cared for me and he helped me. And he was there whenever I needed to talk to him. You know, driving here this afternoon, those things went through my mind. I know we all have to press on to the goal. But Keith became a rock for me. And I thought to myself, what, what am I going to do now? Because Keith was such a great person. He was the one who could encourage me. He was the one who could lift my spirits when I was down. He was the one that I could confide in and talk to. I never had to worry about Keith repeating the things that I needed to talk about. Keith was a very humble man, and we can also say that he was a man who was very uh, down to earth, if you will. He never thought of himself as someone who was above others. Instead, he put others above himself. And as Brother Lee said, Keith was just that kind uh, of a person that he thought more of others than he did himself. And that is a great example for all of us to emulate in our life because that is what the Lord was when he was here. And Keith emulated that in his life. And I could see that. I could see that. <coughs> and so, I say to you that there are some things that I never forget. Even the things that I've learned while Keith was alive, I would go to do something and I could remember, I could hear Keith's voice. And that would help me because I, I can remember his example. You know, another thing, not all of us are the same when it comes to learning. I explained that to Brother Keith one day that I had always had a hard time learning things. I told him not that I couldn't learn, but I said people, I find sometimes preachers would not have the patience with me because I couldn't pick stuff up as fast as they wanted me to. You know, some people I've seen be able to read something or somebody say something, they pick it up. I was never that way, not even in school. But Keith understood that. And therefore, Keith could help me with that. was very, very patient. I told Keith one day, after being with him for some years, I said, you know, Keith, uh, I'm very impressed with, bro with you and Brother Ralph Ryan. I said, this church, I said, you and Brother Ralph are some of the best elders that I've ever seen in the brotherhood. Now, I've been around elders. I've been around elderships. But I tell you, that was the cream of the crop. Because I, I admired their leadership and the way they would lead and the patience that they seemed to have with people and the care and the concern that they had. I told Keith one time, I said, well, you know, we have workshops for every, everything else. I said, you know, it's too bad we can't have them for elders. Because I said, it sure would be nice if some could sit at your feet and listen to some of the advice that you and Ralph could give. And I say to you, 
who have sat under this fine eldership of Brother Keith and Brother Ralph, you've been blessed. You have been blessed beyond your wildest dream. I've preached for about 35 years now. And I still believe that they are up there at the top. And I would encourage the new elders to emulate their lives. And their leadership. <clears throat> the sad reality now is that Brother Keith is uh, gone from this world, and it hurts. It really does hurt. And I know it's going to hurt for a long time because I'm going to miss him, I'm going to miss talking with him, I'm going to miss his corny jokes. <laughs> Especially when every time I'd say something, he, he'd say, well, that's foul. And I'd just shake my head and say, ah, oh, Keith. That was one of his favorite things if you was around him sometimes. Um, I'll miss everything about that man. Brother Keith but I've been blessed that I was allowed to be introduced to him and his good wife, Bobby Jean, because she, <laughs> she's been like a mother to me. And I just can't tell you how much I appreciate deep down inside what both of them have meant to me through the years. I want to leave you with uh, <clears throat> just a few thoughts. You know, when someone we care about dies, we probably feel inside that ourself has been, or part of ourself has been removed. And when sadness and grief come to our hearts, it is but an expression of our need for God who can do more for us than earthly people. I want you to be aware that God knows our sorrows and that God cares. And that's why the Apostle Peter said this in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. He said, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. We have now become a part of the greatest brotherhood the world has ever known. The brotherhood of a broken heart. But I can assure you as I stand here this evening that God has the ability, if we will let him, to take us out of darkness or the darkness of night into the joy of morning. And I'd like to read this poem. I hope that it helps. I'll give a copy to Brother Chris if you'd like to have a copy of it. You can see him sometime. This is referred to as the Grand Canyon of Sorrow. In the journey of life, we will visit at the Grand Canyon of Sorrow called bereavement. The normal steps down into the valley are shock. One is never fully prepared. And then the overflow of emotions called tears. Next, there'll be depression. There'll be doubts and despondency. Then there'll be possible developments of imagined symptoms. There'll be feelings of guilt. If I had only... Resentment, bitterness, and hostility.
But the steps out of that valley are this. First, the acceptance of the fact. Second, time. Because all healing takes time. We know that. And that's what it'll take. Another step out of the valley is to talk freely about it, to give sorrow wings, and then to get up and get out and get going. And I know that that's what Brother Keith would want us to do. And then get busy with a purpose. And then take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. The ranger was right when he answered. It is eight miles down and 80 miles back. He said, however, the Grand Canyon is beautiful on a sunny day when you can see both the shades and the shadows. Ever since the first resurrection, the Grand Canyon of Sorrow looks different in the light of Christian faith, hope, and love. I extend my sympathy to Bobby Jean and the family. Well, I have just a couple of words, and uh, I want to first express my heart's feelings to Bobby Jean's family. These other men learned in a few years. The Lord knew I was a slow learner, and so he started with me 11 years old when I met Keith and Bobby Jean. And there wasn't much to work with, just to be frank. But their influence to this day has left a deep and an abiding mark in my thinking, my heart, and my purpose in serving God. I was thinking as these good comments have been made about what Keith meant to us, what Keith means to us. And I again say Keith and Bobby Jean because they are as matched <coughs> as a matched pair can be. But I think of the words, have you considered my servant, Job? What Keith meant to us is significant. What Keith meant to God is beyond my depth of understanding. Though he was here and served the purpose of God for this generation, now he has gone home. I was in reading somewhere and I mentioned Luke 16 and his comment from made earlier about the angels carrying away. And the brother asked me, uh, you know, have you, have you ever thought that maybe it wasn't just a couple of angels or no, it's plural. So when I think of that, I like to think of it as a myriad of angels coming down. It doesn't do the text any harm. And I've thought of that ever since. Man, what a moment of rejoicing. The fight's over, it's gone. My prayers have been in recent days for Keith and Bobby Jean that the Lord would bring about the best, the kindest, the most merciful path for Keith and this. And I believe God has answered our prayers. There was never a day where I would want to say goodbye and we're with you. He said hello. And we want to say hello again. But it is our responsibility to press forward, to listen to what God has said, because now is the time that you, now is the time that I decide how not only we will live our life, but how we will end our life. And that's one of the things that Keith and Bobby Jean impressed me with through all the years, is that they would take a hopeless case from human eyes and say, in God, in Christ, there is hope. And at no age in life, whether they were young or old, no matter how wicked, how wretched, how much they had rejected the will of God and righteousness, how poorly they had treated other people. But just like Manasseh, the king of old, who was as wretched as any king, God could show him mercy. God will show mercy to me or to you. There is no point, as long as we are still living, that we can't change our minds. And if we've been living and walking with our Lord, what Keith has done for me, and I needed this good uh, prod with all that's been going on. He says, Gail, don't run into the finish line. 
You sprint till you get to the finish line. I heard just in recent weeks, he went to the elders to talk to some folks about maybe placing membership at the local congregation. And it was only uh, just a week and a half or so ago, weak as he was, he was speaking, doing what he could to the brethren. Live your life now for the Lord and press on until you get to the finish line. Free will is indeed yours. You're choosing. Nobody else is choosing for you. You may have got some bad cards dealt, but in Christ Jesus, you can win. You can overcome. And there's no place where that's not the case. One of the many things that Keith and Bobby Jean taught me, and I needed it because this, this is not in my DNA, is patience. They would keep working, they would keep loving, they would keep giving, they would keep being patient with me and so many others. And I express uh, also that, that, that they had and have great humility and there were many a time as a young man, as I was trying to prepare myself to preach and was preaching, I was working hard at filling my head with some things, and I, I come, I come forward pretty strong with Keith and say, "Well, yeah, yeah, well, he knew ten times more about that than I did," <laughs> but he would just be kind and patient. And he said, "Yeah, I'll let you." He didn't say this. This is what he did. I'll let you grow up. You're trying. You just keep trying. And I will just echo those thoughts and words today that he would say, keep trying. In Matthew 7, talking about false teachers, Jesus says, by their fruits, you will know. In the book of Galatians chapter 5, it just speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, about the peace and the joy and the love and all the beautiful fruit that comes from the life that walks with Christ, walks in the spirit, walks for God, it will grow a beautiful garden. And from my human perspective, as I see Keith, the garden that he and Bobby Jean have shared, their lives are full of the peace and the joy and love, the fruit of the spirit. But what's better than that is now he's getting to eat that feast for God Almighty, forever. Let's live, let's walk, putting God first, following the footsteps of Jesus until he leads us to heaven. And there we can rejoice with our dear brother Keith and so many of our other loved ones that he in heaven is rejoicing with this day. To God be the glory <coughs> of everything. Thank you for loving him. He loved you, but our God and his son Jesus love us even more. May we listen, may we take to heart what God says, and may be it our may be our spirit to please him in all things and displease him in them. God bless you as you walk with Christ. Thank you. saying that the Second World War, since the Second World War of our country, there's been a great reason for Americans to reflect on a date like June 6th. Of course, that's the day in 1944 when 156,000 U.S. soldiers descended upon the beaches of Normandy and spread freedom, started to spread freedom to a 
occupied by Axis powers Europe. But I think it also goes without saying that those of us in the household of faith now have another reason to remember June 6th in a positive light because on that day, one of the finest soldiers of Christ completed his mission here on this temporal sphere and retired in that heavenly place that we sing, pray, and oh so often think about. My granddad joins our creator, his beloved son Jesus, and thousands upon thousands of Christians and angels who have gone on before him. To be clear, my granddad is having a joyous time at this very moment. I didn't think of this, but I agree with it wholeheartedly. Brother Bob McPherson is one of the preachers that we're blessed with at Eastside, and he said something the other day that stuck with me. He quoted from 2 Samuel 3, and <coughs> verse 38, that said, uh, Do you not realize that a great prince and a great man has fallen this day? Those were the words of King David with regard to the loss of Abner. And those words are very applicable in this circumstance. You might not have known it, but my granddad was born into his life with a heart murmur. But if you know what all that man accomplished in his 84 years on this earth, you wouldn't have known it. He wasn't allowed to go do some of the things that other people that had a healthy physical condition would have been able to do, but he did not let that stop him. If you had the pleasure of knowing my granddad, you're aware there were many a reason to enjoy being around him, and I'm not going to give you a litany of every reason why. These are just a few. My granddad was a sponge for world history. He spent so much time absorbing what it had to tell us he was especially a fan of the Civil War and enjoyed, as I'm sure most of you well know, dressing up in his Union uniform and participating in local parades or reenactments over the, over the years. More so, of course, he loved Bible history, and he spent the majority of his life engrossed in the Word and learning as much about it as he could. We talked about this already. He loved to laugh. That man woke up with a smile on his face. One of my favorite things about my granddad was to hear him laugh. It was infectious. Sometimes I think he told us stories and jokes just so he had a reason to laugh. But I know he garnered as much enjoyment out of, out of hearing us respond in laughter. Each time we were together as kids, I always looked forward to asking him to tell us a new joke, and he never disappointed. We laughed over many a game of caroms. <laughs> and I tell you what, if our fingers weren't hurting by the end of all those games, we would have kept playing. <clears throat> the man had an endless, endless well of love. Love for his wife. Love for his sons. <clears throat> his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and he loved the church. He also loved those outside of our family circle and spent a great deal of time helping folks that I'll never know and, and he wanted to just help them in any way that he could. My grandfather was genuine. The smile he had on his face was real all the time and it was always there. You never had to worry about what angle granddad was coming at you from because he just wanted the best for you. He was just trying to help or assist in any way that he could. I never actually saw that man angry a day in my life. My granddad was also into fishing. When we were kids, he used to take Ren and I and my brother fishing. We'd go to various pay lakes, the pond at my aunt and uncle's farm, and I'm sure there were other places I can't even remember. But judging from the handful of times he took us out, Ren and I really weren't too keen on fishing. We don't really do it that much today. Outside of the occasional bluegill crappie or 
small catfish. We never really caught anything overly impressive. But that was not really anything against Granddad. Uh, that was more so us. I'm quite sure he was more concerned with the time that he was spending with us at that age. But don't let Ren and I's track record fool you because my grandfather was quite adept at another type of fishing. Luke 5, 1 through 11 tells us that one day as Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of those boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out in the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a huge number of fish that their nets began to break. They signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled their boat so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees, and, his, and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishers of men. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. My grandfather spent the greater portion of his life on earth doing just that, following him, fishing for men in many places, both abroad and stateside. He did this to fulfill the command Jesus gave all of us in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything he has commanded. So those things that I talked about that my granddad possessed as qualities, his genuine personality, his infectious smile, his storytelling capabilities, his knowledge of history, and his love for fishing, they all amalgamated into one larger ability, which was for him to preach the word in a way that was understandable, appreciative, appreciated, full of knowledge, and most of all, convicting. He did not care who you were, or where you were from, just so long as you would let him work on your soul. June 6, 1944 was the starting point of the liberation of occupied Europe, and by war's end, the mission had been accomplished. The difference between that physical war waged so long ago and the one that we're fighting as Christians today, if you are a Christian here, and I hope that you are, is that ours is not over yet. And as Gail mentioned a few minutes ago, that's what we have to decide, is how to live the rest of our lives. And I want to live my life in a way that is an honor to that man's legacy. He may not be able to sit down at the kitchen table, or visit you at the jail, or converse with you over the airwaves on the radio talk show Bible Talks anymore and have a Bible study, but each of us this day and going forward can live each of our lives in a way that we guarantee that we will once again be able to see our loved ones and my granddad in the great by and by. We will miss you, granddad, but only for a little while. Tell the priest not to put me behind the lane. But that's the way it did. What do I think of when I think of my dad? Most of us that are Bible students and read our Bibles, we know Hebrews chapter 11 is that hall of fame of the faithful. In Hebrews 11 verse 1 and 2 it says, Now faith is the substance of things hopeful, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Then on down in the same chapter, in verse 16, it says, But now they desire better, that is, the heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And you might be thinking, well, I see where this is going. My dad had a big faith. 
He wasn't ashamed to, be, to call God his God. But I'm going to kind of go back to a different chapter in the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8, it says, These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. And there they list 37 mighty men. Even one of them was Uriah the Hittite, which is kind of interesting considering what happened to him. But why do I mention these mighty men? Because I put my dad in that category, not physically, but spiritually. You know, Blaine mentioned that my dad had a heart murmur. He couldn't join the military. You know, I never saw my dad work out with weights, but I'm sure he carried quite a few milk buckets when he was raised on the farm. I didn't see him work out, jog, bike, etc. But the way he lifted was his spiritual sword. The word of God. The Bible. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 through 13, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit. And of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I think of my dad as a mighty man, a mighty warrior in God's army, leading others to Christ in obedience to his word. has obtained a good testimony. That's what I think of when I think of my dad. Love you, Dad. I, I'm the last speaker tonight. Doesn't mean you're going to get out of here soon, but <laughs> uh, these men Keith personally mentioned and some other names along the line, along the way, as he knew that this day would come. But uh, we know that there are so many even here this evening that would have thoughts to share and memories. And a lot of what we say will be repetitious because apparently we all knew the same man. Whether you were a gospel preacher, an elder of the church, a son, a grandson, a close family member. We all knew the same man, and he was the same for everybody. And he shared the same love. Bobby Jean, our love and our hearts are with you and your family, of which we all think that we're a part of. And we will always be. So we hope and pray that our words and memories will comfort you and your family. We knew and remember Keith in our own way. We all have our own stories. I thought I heard all the stories. Even a few weeks ago, Keith was telling me another story that I hadn't heard before. And I looked at him like, well, I hadn't heard that one yet. I thought I'd heard them all several times over. But as you've heard from just a few of his dearest friends and family this evening, many of our stories have that familiar ring to them. I'd like to talk about a man who, for some reason, took me under his wing and guided me for the past 16 years. So I'm of a newer generation. Yes, Brent is way older than I am. But we not only shared a pulpit in the church of our Lord, but we shared this pulpit right here. We both stood in the same spot so many times, I, I can't tell you. I feel bad that I can't remember all the funerals that we spoke at together. We never preached anybody into heaven, but we had confidence of those that <laughs> laid in that spot. And I knew what I was going to say, and we all knew what Keith was going to say. Because he preached the gospel. And we spoke together as many of our members and dear friends passed on from this life to the next. 
So this pulpit feels a little more empty now. And I appreciate the good men that have stood here tonight. But you'd understand, I think, if I said that I trade all of your words for one more message from Keith, wouldn't you? It's no offense. But he always felt that this was a good place to remind the people who are living that time is precious. And being here is a reminder to get right with Christ right away. And these are the very things that he spoke of even a few weeks ago in his last recorded video as we studied the Bible from 1 Thessalonians. And you can hear those words on Northside's YouTube channel that I'll be sharing publicly probably tomorrow. And even in a frail state, he still was that mighty man that his son spoke of in preaching and imparting the word. So I've never known a man who truly seemed to love life as much as he did. I've never known a man with more patience, hope, and with a more positive outlook in life and for the life to come. You know, so many struggle day by day and look to God as just an escape from this life. But Keith was a man who saw God's blessings in everything that life had to offer. He was blessed with a loving wife, has been mentioned several times, who kept him in line. I always loved it when she would have to go out of town. And that, that last day or two before you would return, Keith and I couldn't do anything because he had to go home and clean. <laughs> I don't think, though, he really did it to not get in trouble. I think he did it because he really loved you and wanted your approval and everything. When Keith heard that, I keep saying the term, sweet southern bell, and she hasn't corrected me yet, so you like that, right? He went to a gospel meeting many years ago, and he knew a blessing from God when he heard it and saw it. He heard that voice singing praise and hymns to God. It, it doesn't matter that she was actually there with another boy. I think he got the number. And basically, their love and work together throughout the years was inspiring. To watch them play a board game together or cards together is pretty much one of the most hilarious things that you'll ever see in your life. And their home is a welcome home to all those that they loved. And they love everyone. And everyone loves them. I can't encapsulate 84 years into a few minutes. I told Keith just a few hours before he passed away that I had so much to say to him. He couldn't hear me at first because I was a blubbering mess. <laughs> and you know what he said? He said, write it down. <laughs> I found in those last few hours that Keith was not a man that really wanted to get sentimental about him all this. I tried with him. I tried to share those words. Keith, don't you know what you meant to me? Yeah, but uh, you know, the, you know the, the problems in the church in the 60s need to be dealt with. You know, <laughs> We got to teach that truth. And he taught me till the end. He preached till the end. As I always knew he would. Pardon the expression, but I've always said He'll drop dead teaching the gospel. Keith, when I first started preaching at Northside, it was always described to me that he retired from preaching. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> he was the hardest working retired man I've ever met in my life. He ran circles around me, the young guy that was supposed to show up and preach for a congregation that already had great teachers of the gospel. They put a work into place that I just got to step into. Being at Northside has never a struggle for me. It's been a blessing. I wouldn't trade it for the world. They'd have to kick me out, I guess. But in many ways, it was easy to ride along that ride with Keith and Ralph and our good deacons and men that serve as our elders today. 
We have shared a time of peace. And God has blessed us as a congregation and as individuals, as Christians. And they put into place a work and a strength that any congregation would have. Well, I think it's already been mentioned by Brother John and others. What a blessing. So, he said, put a couple pages together. Well, I have five pages. Uh, that's not nearly enough. But the words that we share today are just a few of the memories that we'll be sharing for the rest of our lives. I doubt I could ever preach a lesson again without thinking of something that Keith taught. We will forever be saying phrases like, remember what Keith used to say? We'll say it in our classes, we'll say it from the pulpit. And so whatever we do not say to you tonight, we pray that the Lord will give us time to always remember and to let his life soak into our minds. I've never known a man more studious about God's word. You know, Keith called God's plan of salvation. You go back and listen to some of those recordings from the radio. And listen for words like staggering, beautiful, wonderful. He would throw in another staggering just for emphasis. He really felt that way about God's word. And using the text from Keith's favorite version of the Bible, this is the American Standard Version of 1901, as he would always say. This is not his Bible. This is a Bible exactly like his because I bought one exactly like Keith's. Because there aren't too many people in this world you want to be exactly like. You've kept bugging me yesterday at church. No offense to anybody, but aren't you hot in that tie? We have outdoor services right now because we got this virus thing going on. In case you didn't know. <laughs> aren't you hot in that coat? And I never said it, but I'm saying it now. Keith would have worn it. I want to follow his example. So using this favorite text of his, I believe that this passage sums up very well Keith's love for God's word. Psalm 119, verses 97 through 106. The American Standard Version, 1901. <clears throat> oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thy commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have kept thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might observe thy word. I have not turned aside from thine ordinances, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words to my taste, yea, sweet, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I have confirmed it, that I will observe thy righteous ordinances. There are things in this passage that remind us that we can be as wise as the ancients, the aged. I asked Keith one time, I said, all these stories, all the things that you know, why don't, why don't you write, write about that, write a book? And we both agreed, because at the time we both weren't really writers. We just preached what was already written. And he said, and like I said, we both agreed. A lot of things have already been written. But he was studious because he read those writings. He trusted in God's word. And he relied upon the precepts that God revealed in his word. And this was his, his writing. This was his way of life. And he put it to use, as we've already been pointed out in our other discussions tonight. I, I've never known a man more benevolent than he. You know, many people will say they'll work for food. You've seen those signs, right? Have you ever given them a job to do? Keith has. get you out there mowing the grass, pull weeds in the garden. Our landscaping around the building always looked nice for some reason because Keith found a man that would work for food. He taught a man to fish. You know that old saying, right? When he gave a handout of his own pocket for nothing in return, he never expected it to be repaid. And for those who owed him, he forgave them. For those who repaid him, he commended them. He appreciated that. But he was a giving man. In Matthew 25 and verse 34, I see the epitome of Keith Burnett in this passage, where the Lord says, Let me 
American Standard Version, 1901. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry and fed thee, or a thirst and gave thee drink? And when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? And when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did unto one of these, my brethren, even these least, ye did it unto me. That's the servant that our God knows in Keith Burnett. I've never known a man more respected as a leader. Keith, as you know, was not only a gospel preacher, a wonderful teacher most of his adult life, he also served as an elder for nearly three decades. I've always said that if a man wanted to be an elder in the Lord's church, he needed to spend some time with men like Keith. Everyone in the church depended on him. They would call on him from everything, from spiritual guidance to even those outside of the church. I remember a man who was a member of another church, another religion even, if you will. He wanted someone to teach some of his family members the gospel. And guess who he called? He called Keith. He wasn't even a member of our congregation. He was respected and he was loved. He was trusted. All of you here tonight know that. But I've never known a man with more hope for those that were lost. He traveled across the world to save souls. He studied and converted inmates at the local jail, and he would travel to see some when they were transferred. He converted criminals, and in some cases he preached their funerals. He converted homosexuals, patiently taught them the truth. It can be done. It can be done. He went on national TV and was mocked by the public on the Bill Donahue show. Still trying to find a video of that, by the way. I think that would be a great YouTube video. Still applies today. He was truly a man of great patience, and he gave the benefit of the doubt to any who made mistakes along the way. He taught others to learn from their mistakes, and he forgave them when he was personally wronged, just as, guess who, the Lord would do. I've never known a man with more knowledge of history and heritage, as his grandson pointed out, with that proper and ironic application of June 6. Keith had a deep appreciation for the past, not only the events that shaped us as a nation, but our heritage, where we came from, who our people were. You'd introduce yourself, and you would try to figure out your last name, where you're from, where your people were from. This reflected in his knowledge from the teaching of God's word. And when he spoke of Bible lands, he always reminded us of the places that the gospel was preached. Places like Tarsus, which is modern day Turkey. Some of you know what I meant by it when I said that, right? Yeah, try sitting in a Bible class and not hearing that phrase from Keith modern-day Turkey, and so on. He traveled these places. He kept them dear to his heart. He made the Bible accounts come alive for us. I've never known a man more involved in his community. Even though his home was in the north, Illinois, his heart was wherever he lived, especially with his family. He and Bobby Jean made their home here in Russellville for the past 40 years and played an important role in community and politics. But he never had the opportunity to serve in the military, as was pointed out, or hold a political office. Yet Keith <coughs> was the most patriotic man I have ever known. Let me say it again. He was the most patriotic man I've personally ever known. It's not because he wore a flag in his lapel. It's not because he dressed entirely in red, white, and blue for government holidays and parades. <laughs> we have pictures. Um, 
No, he loved this country. He loved our freedoms, and he loved to be able to take that freedom and go other places to share that message of God's word, which is what his freedom was all about. He was one of the men behind the scenes who promoted godliness, morality, and fairness in our leaders. And this community is better because of Keith Burnett. I've never known a man more supportive in the Lord's work of struggling preachers and churches. He was instrumental in supporting others who taught the word of God. He supported and encouraged preachers in foreign lands and built relationships with those brethren who honored him so much that they even named their children after him. He supported young men to preach and he taught and influenced many, even myself, who for the life of me still can't figure out why. He was patient and chose to work with me for the past 16 years. I don't know that I'll ever know the answer to that. When I tell people I've worked with Northside for almost 16 years now, I'm reminded it's not because of me. But it's because of that congregation. It's because of those good members. And it's because of men like Keith Burnett. So I'll defer to the words of our brother Luke Metzger here this evening, a young man and dear friend who worked with us, Keith and I both, during a summer preaching program we hosted just a few years ago. And he wrote a loving tribute to Keith yesterday, and I'd like to share that with you. It was Brother Keith who reached out to a struggling college student at the end of his second semester asking him to join in a summer of serious Bible study and preacher training. It was Brother Keith who spent countless hours that summer teaching by example the importance of serving the lowly, extending grace to the needy, and loving the unlovable. It was Brother Keith who sacrificed things like time, money, sleep, emotions, and sometimes all four if it meant reaching someone with the gospel and leading them to Christ. It was Brother Keith who demonstrated so clearly what selfless love looked like in his 61 faithful years of marriage to his wife, Bobby Jean. It was Brother Keith who would be the first to extend a helping hand to the hurting presence, to the lonely, and sympathy to the suffering. It was Brother Keith who boldly preached the gospel for over 65 years in places others wouldn't risk going, foreign countries, jails, etc. It was Brother Keith who not only talked about heaven and the importance of getting there, but lived a life that reflected anticipation of meeting his maker. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant, Keith Burnett, a blameless and upright man who feared God and turned away from evil? In Christ, death does not get the last word. Death just holds the door to home. Thank you, Luke, for your inspiring words. When we had that program those summers ago, I was kind of done with working with young men. And then you came along, and you refreshed us both. Well, finally, I've never known a man more prepared to go to heaven. We believe that Keith is with the Lord in that place of comfort called paradise. You can read about it in Luke chapter 16. For he and all those who have passed on before wait, as we do, for the coming of Jesus Christ. I don't think I've ever appreciated and looked forward to heaven as much as I do now. In the past few weeks, anticipating that that day would come, as he prepared himself and was at peace, it caused us to think and to rethink our view of heaven and having a home with God someday when that day of judgment comes. Are we prepared? He was prepared. And he was ready to go. So he let loose the bonds of this life. And knowing that Keith was ready to go, knowing that he was so close to the end and passing over to that spiritual existence gives us greater hope. I know he's in the comfort of paradise. But wait a minute. <laughs> we can't really say that, right? You know, that's God's judgment. Well, I'm saying it. And I mean because God in his word tells us to believe in it. God in his word tells us 
to work toward it. And you know what else God tells us to do? He tells us to follow the examples of the people that are doing it. So you see, if Keith is not there, then neither will I be because he has been my example. I follow in his footsteps by the same Bibles he does. I wear the same ties he does. Yes, those are physical things. But living spiritually as a man like Keith did. You follow him. You follow him after this life. You follow him in the way to God. And if you deny that now, you are a fool. And you will perish. That's not what he wanted. That's not what he wanted. It's not what he worked toward. It wasn't just about him. It was about each and every one of us sitting in this room, each and every one of us that has passed through the line tonight to, to see him and greet his grieving wife and family. The Lord said he'll come with vengeance on those that do not know God and do not obey his gospel. Those are some of the last words that Keith preached in that study we had. And in a last effort, in a last effort to impart the gospel to men, honestly, what would be your last words? She will tell the story better than I. There's no last words he spoke to his wife were. In Jesus Christ. Name I pray, amen. Just a couple more quick thoughts, I promise. Y'all want me to talk to them? On my uh, <clears throat> last visit with Keith, we had no problem speaking openly of death. And I asked him to wait for us. We'll catch up. Are you ready to catch up? It begins with obedience to the Lord. I don't know that many of us will ever have the faith and knowledge that Keith had. But what a wonderful goal to work toward. We have big shoes to fill. Big steps to follow. Big strides to walk behind. And we will continue that work that Keith has done. And continue to encourage and bring people to the Lord. If the Lord will bless us along the way. I know he blessed Keith. Keith would want you to obey the Lord just as he did. I'll leave you with this. But to live in the flesh. In Philippians 1, 22-24. The American Standard Version, 1901. But if to live in the flesh. This shall bring fruit from my work. Then what I shall choose, I know not. But I am in a strait betwixt the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. For it is very far better. On behalf of the family and myself, I appreciate the presence of everyone here tonight. We're going to close with a prayer. I'd like to ask for all to bow with me and, and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the Almighty, the designer, the creator, and maker of all that is seen and unseen. You created us in your image from the dust of the ground. And it is you that decides when our body will return to dust. We believe that you can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We know from your word that we are here for a relatively short time. That this life passes, and in your time, 
you will come to judge the living and the dead. We ask that all of us here will examine ourselves and conduct our lives in a way that we might be counted worthy to enter the joys of everlasting life when we stand before you. May we always remember Keith as a part of him lives on in us and through us. May we be diligent in studying your word and be committed to doing good works and bearing much fruit as we know Keith was. Give us strength to be faithful and caring till death, as we know Keith was. Give us your peace, which surpasses our understanding, as we could see in our brother Keith. Take our hand and lead us across the finish line as you did for Brother Keith. <coughs> Although saddened that we will no longer have Keith to converse with, to study with, to learn from, to enjoy a laugh with, just to observe the excellent example that he sets. May we all be better Christians as we incorporate into our lives those godly characteristics of Keith Burnett. We ask that you comfort Bobby Jean Keith's family, as we know how much they will miss Keith, his presence in their lives, his contagious smile, his care, his leadership, and his love for all.